Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Segru, the director of the Penn Social Science and Policy Forum, and I am uh, delighted to welcome you here for um, the next of our ongoing workshops on poverty and opportunity. Um, this is the second to last workshop of this semester. The final one will be on Friday, December 12th, uh, and it will be Margaret Weir, who is professor of sociology at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, who is going to be um, looking at the politics of uh, poverty in the United States. Um, it should be a really stimulating presentation. It's the very last Friday after classes are over. Uh, and so uh, we look forward to seeing um, all of you there. I'm delighted to introduce uh, this afternoon's speaker, Aaron Jumbay. He is assistant, or, sorry, associate professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany, uh, and was a visiting faculty member last year in the economics department at MIT. His area of expertise is labor market policies with an emphasis on low wage workers. He's done extensive research on minimum wage laws, as well as research on other types of employer mandates, uh, in particular the effects of minimum wage differentials across state borders, where the minimum wage is higher on one side of the border um, than on the other. Uh, he's also uh, written uh, many, many important articles in major journals in the field, uh, but also uh, uh, as, as befitting someone presenting at the Social Science and Policy Forum, uh, uh, articles in uh, other disciplines fields, including uh, an interesting article in the American Journal of Public Health called Early Responses to San Francisco's Paid Sick Leave Policy, um, and also uh, an article on cross-border spillover U.S. gun laws and violence in Mexico, which was published in the flagship Political Science Journal, the American Political Science Review. So uh, with no further ado, I will turn the floor over to Aaron, who will be speaking about minimum wages setting a higher bar. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for being here and for having me. I'm happy to talk uh, about minimum wages. Um, and I'm going to try to keep my presentation accessible. Uh, so I'm going to try to avoid using too much jargons. I'm going to not fully succeed, I will warn you now, because there are some methodological issues uh, I hope to convey along the way, but um, uh, important considerations when we think about this policy. So minimum wages have been in the news. I don't know if you can quite read that. There are just some headlines here. Uh, big night for minimum wage increase on November 4th. Uh, la uh, the election day when there were four states and two cities had ballot initiatives in um, uh, for increasing the minimum wage. They all passed. Uh, there was also an interesting issue about the Democrats pinning their hopes on minimum wages in for winning the election. It didn't work out very well. I'll have more to say about that. I think that dovetails interesting with the politics of minimum wage. But what we found on, uh, on election night is that four states, including uh, four Republican-leaning states, voted uh, by, by sizable margins to increase the minimum wage to 9.75 an hour by 2016 in Alaska, 8.50 in Arkansas by 2017, $9 an hour 2016 in Nebraska, and 8.50 in South Dakota. To keep that in perspective, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. And at the same time, two cities, San Francisco and Oakland, increased their minimum wage to $15 and $12.25 an hour, respectively, uh, over a period of time. So the, all these numbers are just like, what? $7 to $15 is a big range. <laughs> uh, what do they mean? And I'm hope, I hope to convey some of that to you, uh, to go beyond the top line numbers and thinking about the bite of the minimum wage and where the minimum wage is at the state, at the city. And that's going to be something we'll keep in mind. Um, but it's useful to, to sort of keep a perspective on, on what's happening in, in, in minimum wages at various levels of government. So the, the, today, I hope to do three things. And they're, they're, there's a lot packed in here. So I'll try to go through. And I really appreciate any uh, questions along the way. So please feel free to interrupt. I, almost used to that being an economist. That's, I, I feel weird if I'm not being interrupted in seminars. Uh, in the first part, I'll talk about the evolution of minimum wages, what's happened at the federal and the state level in the US, how it compares to other countries. In the second part, I'm going to go uh, a little deep in the methodo methodological debates, because it's hard to avoid that. 
That is also my bread and butter. And so I will talk about what I think we know about minimum wages with respect to jobs, prices, turnover, inequality, and poverty. It's a lot. So we'll, we'll talk about it, and I'll give you a sense of some of the controversies and why, what I, where I think that is today. Um, and then really try to, I'm going to try really hard to make sure I get, have enough time on the third part, because I think that's quite interesting, is about where do we go from here? I mean, there's a lot that's already that's happening. How do we make sense of it is maybe a better question. And then thinking about the federal minimum wage, can we do a better job, a smarter job? And I'm going to argue that there are certain things we can do that makes a lot of sense economically and politically, and that's rare. So the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 established the minimum wage. It established it using the Commerce Clause. And as a result, initially, the minimum wage primarily applied to manufacturing workers, workers in tradable sectors where interstate commerce was an issue. You had state-level minimum wages at, actually at that time in some places to cover other workers like those in retail, um, but there were few and far between. So for most part, initially, the minimum wage was something that applied to a particular segment of the workforce. Over time, coverage expanded substantially. So by the 70s, essentially, most private sector workers, actually most workers uh, in the workforce, were covered legally by the federal minimum wage. That happened over time. There are some interesting and important exceptions, like agriculture does not get covered by the federal minimum wage. Some states have separate laws covering agricultural workers. Independent contractors uh, are not covered by minimum wage, as they're not by generally a lot of other labor or employment laws. Um, so while the coverage is expanded, however, the level of the minimum wage is not kept up with respect to either cost of living or other wages in the economy. And a way to make this point here is by taking the lighter shaded green line showing the minimum wage as a fraction of the median wage of full-time workers in the US versus the other developed countries, the OECD countries, over time. And what you find here is that between 1968, which was the high water mark for the federal minimum wage, uh, at that time the minimum wage stood in real dollars, in today's dollars, around $9.50 or $0.60 an hour. So it's fallen in today's dollar to $7.25. So that means less purchasing, uh, less purchasing power for that, for that federal minimum wage. It's also the case that it, it stood at something like 55% of the median wage for full-time workers back then versus it stands something around 38% today. So this is going to be important because what you find is that over the 60s and the 70s, roughly the minimum wage stood around half of the median wage if you average over this period. But certainly it stood most of the time above 45% of the median wage. If you look at OECD countries, Either today, these are countries you know, ranging from UK, Canada, other developed countries. Uh, the average, both historically as well as today across countries, is around 50% of the median wage. So that's a very normal, standard thing to do. We are second to last in that metric, uh, just above Czech Republic at 38% of the median wage. So this is, we're, we're an outlier when it comes to the federal minimum wage, both by historical as well as comparative standards. Now, while the federal minimum wage has not kept pace, and you'll note there, it particularly did not keep pace uh, during essentially starting in late 70s when er inflation eroded away the minimum wage uh, partly and then continued to decline in real terms uh, over, over a pretty long stretch. We went essentially for a decade without increasing the minimum wage nominally at the federal level during the 80s and then another decade during the 90s and mid-2000s. So that took away a lot of the value. Question? I'm a little bit confused about what the, the dark green line is because I know for a lot of those OECD countries, they actually don't have minimum wages. They have contracted 
Absolutely. Contractually bargained wages, which then might apply to. These are ones that actually have a statutory minimum wage. So all of these here. But the UK didn't have a statutory minimum wage. Exactly. So, so you know. it does today. But so these are historical averages based, that's a good question, on whoever happens to have it at the time. So you're absolutely right that the sample is somewhat changing over time because we have seen an increase. UK is a good example. Didn't have one until, until around here. Um, so UK is not in this sample, but it is in that sample. But adjusting for the composition of it is not a big deal. So for the countries that actually did have back in the 70s, it was you know it, the main story of having stood on average something around the half is, is, is the case also. Which you're absolutely right. This is not a, as we say, a balanced panel of countries because the number of countries that actually have a statutory minimum is different. Today, these are the countries that have it. Uh, so some countries, including ones with really high minimum, high wages overall, like some of the Scandinavian countries, Denmark does not have a statutory minimum wage. It does have a lowest wage you can be paid based on collective bargaining. Uh, that may vary by sectors and industries, uh, but, um, but that's correct. I'm just wondering if the social minimum wage in some of these countries might actually be a better analogy. I mean, even though that's sort of the welfare wage, I mean, some of these countries have a have a wage floor. But do you mean in terms of with tax and transfer policies? Because then we're in a different world. There's a lot of, absolutely, there's a lot of issues going on. I'm going to touch on some of that in the US context. Um, but I think the way to, for me to think about the minimum wage is what it is that an hour's worth of work that an employer has to compensate. There are many ways which we can affect distributional outcomes. Minimum wage is but one of them. Tax and transfer policies arguably play a bigger role because they reach a larger portion of the, of, the, of the workforce and people who are not working. So I think the minimum wage, one of the things that I try to make, make an argument for is that it's a, it's a, it can be an effective tool for certain things, but it's a limited one. It only reaches between 5 and 15% of the workforce, depending on how high it is historically. Um, and so I think there, a lot of those issues uh, matter. And it interacts with other taxes and transfer policies. But the, if we look at the minimum wage, or the, as I said, the federal minimum wage stagnated for extensive periods of time. At the same time, states and increasingly cities have picked up uh, the slack and introduced their own state level or local minimum wages. So at, for example, until the, 19, until the 90s, there were relatively few states that had a state level minimum wage. Certainly before 1980, very few did. And that's because the minimum wage pretty much increased fairly regularly at the federal level. So when we went for a stretch of nearly 10 years without raising the nominal minimum wage at the federal level, a number of states started to increase there or Im Im actually impose a minimum wage. So you had about 12 states back in 1990 and you can see that essentially the way it works is that the number of states that have a minimum wage above the federal tends to fall when the federal minimum wage rises. So you have this pattern where again in 96, 97 when the minimum wage rose you went from having 10 to something like five states or six states that are higher than the federal. But then you went for about 10 years, where between 97 and 2007, where there was no federal minimum wage increase. And what you saw is, so, is a really sizable increase in the number of states, rising to around, I think, 30, 32 states at, at its height in 2007 that had a minimum wage greater than the federal one. Many of those states saw their minimum wage superseded by the federal wage increase in 2007, 2008. But then again, as the fe federal minimum wage has stayed stagnant at a nominal level, the number of states has crept up again. Today, we have with the additional states in the last election last week, we have about 27 states that have a, federal, uh, that have a state minimum wage higher than the federal. At the same time, we also have Starting in the 2000s, the phenomenon of having cities, these are large cities like San Francisco, um, San Diego, Seattle prominently now, that have 
citywide minimum wages. I'm going to have more to talk about that. For, for our purposes right now, the point is to note what we have seen is generally a proliferation of minimum wages at a variety of level. Yes? I'm sorry, I promise this is the last thing I'll ask. Please, I hope not. So, um, do, are state minimum wages, do they tend to be indexed and so they're automatically rising again in relation to the federal? Great rate? question. I, I'll have more to say about this too. There's 15 states with indexation. Okay. Yeah. So of the 26, 7, 15 of them have indexed. All but one, here's an interesting politics of minimum wage tidbit number one. <laughs> Indexation almost never happens at the legislature. Doesn't matter how blue or how red. Come back to that and remember that. It's almost always through ballot initiatives. And this is, this is political economy of minimum wage tidbit number one. So what we see over time is both increase in the number of states and hence just the dispersion of minimum wages we have across the states in the US. Back in the 1980s, you had very little. In the 2000s, you have much more. Here I'm just plotting the, the, the 50th, 75th, and the 90th percentile versus the federal minimum wage. So that gives you the spread, sense of the spread of how much minimum wage is increasing. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that if you don't have much variation across places, there isn't a whole lot you can do to estimate the effect of a policy except using variation over time. And I'll come back to that. So the good news here is that, boy, there's a lot of variation. That's, that, that's good news for, for, for an economist or any social scientist trying to use quasi-experimental variation. The bad news it's going to turn out is that these, are not, these states are not randomly dispersed across the country. And so you really have to worry about having appropriate control groups. Um, but you can sort of see some of that by, by looking at it, the wages today in 2014. As you'll see, the highest wages tend to be here in the coastal areas and in the northeast uh, with, a, with a smattering of places, uh, you know, Illinois, uh, w some, some other places. And those other places, including some of these red states, are always via ballot initiatives. They have passed via ballot initiatives because minimum wages tend to pull very strongly across political ideological divide. Um, one of, I think one of, the, one of the things not fully digested, including by the Democrats, is people are very happy to increase minimum wage and not vote for Democrats. Uh, that, and <laughs> so, there, so that's the counterside to the fact that there's fairly broad, um, broad based support for increasing minimum wages up to, up to fairly high levels. Um, you can see, and these are the states that in the last election uh, voted to increase minimum wages, the low, the lo usually by margins at least more than 60% supporting the increase, except for in, in, in South Dakota, I believe, where it was lower. But um, in all cases that I know of that the minimum wage has been put on the ballot, um, it has passed. And there's certainly more than 15 or so cases that I can think of. Um, so with that in mind, this just plots for you and uh, the states in the last you know, 25, 22 years in this case that, tended, that have tended to have higher minimum wages. Again, if you go back to say 1980, these states would have actually fairly similar nominal minimum wage versus if you come, you know, t averaged over 1990 to 2002, 12, these states the, in the darker shading have had higher minimum wages. Now, you'll note one thing. <laughs> Anyone that, who, who, who was up on the election night in 2012 will recognize this map. This map is virtually identical, except for Virginia here, <laughs> I think, uh, to uh, the states that President Obama carried <laughs> in that election. So again, exhibit number one of non-random distribution of high and low minimum wage states. So this creates some problem because besides the different politics of these states, which of course can contribute to the fact that they may also adopt different policies over the last 25 years, it's also the case that uh, th these higher minimum wage states have tended to see a greater reduction in middle wage or routine occupations, sometimes 
uh, economists talk about polarization, kind of jobs like manufacturing and others that require routine task intensive th uh, jobs have tended to fall more. Most economists wouldn't consider that I anywhere close to being a causal effect for the minimum wage itself because these are jobs much higher in the distribution. Um, similarly, these states have seen greater growth in the inequality in the upper half of the wage distribution and they tend to have sharper business cycle fluctuations. I list these not because I'm suggesting that the minimum wage has any causal effect on these things. In fact, precisely that it does not. And yet, these states vary substantially means that you may worry about when you're looking at the bottom part of the wage distribution, what's happening to jobs in restaurants or what's happening to jobs of those without a high school degree or teens. You may really worry that there's different both labor demand and supply factors as well as institutional or policy factors that vary across these states that you really need to have a good way of accounting for in order to get a valid causal estimate. So, uh, there's a decently high correlation, but state EITCs tend to be fairly small and um, the number of states that have had state EITC is also smaller than the number of minimum wage. But there, there, there's a good, I don't know exactly the number, but I would guess somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7 is probably the correlation coefficient. So um, some of the, so you know, given, given what I just said about these differences in characteristics of these states, uh, you know, uh, we, we, of course, would worry about comparing different states. But prior to 1990, and most of the literature, given the nature of the variation, was mostly over time, didn't even, wasn't even able to do that, right? So instead, what most of the literature prior to the 90s did was to look just over time. Here's minimum wage went up in the US. What happened to jobs? And using what we call time series variation. Most economists today would consider those evidence to be fairly unreliable. It turns out they're also highly fragile. So labor economists have mostly moved on from, from that literature. Starting in the early 90s, however, so we do have see these variations across states. If you remember the number of states uh, that actually have a higher than federal minimum wage increase in that period. And there's sort of a couple of approaches using that variation that emerged. One that I will call for our purposes, the canonical model for people with, who you know, use panel data methods uh, will think of this as a state and year two-way fixed effects model. Now, I'll explain what that means in a second. This canonical model essentially assumes parallel trends across states. That means that states can differ in their levels, but they're roughly growing in tandem is the assumption, because only uh, as long as you control for some other types of things that you can actually control for in your data set, but everything else is assumed to essentially move together in, 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 in tandem, is the assumption of that model. And I'm going to call that the canonical model. In this, in the minimum wage literature, sort of applied, one of the first applications was by uh, David Newmark and Bill Washer back in 1992. Um, and but I will argue and try to provide some evidence here today that the assumption of parallel trends is not a good one. Um, Massachusetts and Texas are not great comparisons in terms of what they would have been had there been the same minimum wage. Um, and there are other methods that may actually provide more reliable estimates of the causal effect of, say, increasing the minimum wage in Massachusetts. A different strand around of literature around the same time tried to leverage this variation across places more granular fashion. So probably one of the best known studies to date of minimum wage effects is from um, a paper in 1994 in the American Economic Review by David Card and Alan Kruger, uh, who studied New Jersey and Pennsylvania fast food restaurants. And, and sort of the novelty of this study was they actually went and surveyed fast food restaurants following an increasing before and after this New Jersey minimum wage increase occurred. 
And here, sorry, here in, uh, this is just a map showing where, where those restaurants are located. And they essentially chose New, all of New Jersey and Pennsylvania that was sort of closer to, closer to New Jersey. And they found that using this, using their survey of restaurants, fast food restaurants in particular, they did not find any evidence that New Jersey restaurants actually saw a dip in jobs following the increase in the minimum wage as compared to the Pennsylvania ones. So uh, in fact, depending on how they cut the data, it, may, it suggested there may have even been a positive effect of the minimum wage and jobs. So this, of course, created a whole lot of controversy within the discipline and really shook things up in a, a variety of ways. In a fall and leading to a back and forth with David Newmark and Bill Washer, in a follow-up work in 2000, also published in the American Economic Review, uh, Cardin Kruger used representative payroll records from unemployment insurance filings covering nearly all of the workforce instead of relying on a self-collected survey. And, where it, and looking also at a reverse experiment when the minimum wage went up in Pennsylvania, not New Jersey, later on in the 90s. And with all of that, they essentially came to the conclusion that there was probably very little effect on jobs either way. This, um, their, both their data as well as, I think, generally their method is something that in a set of papers uh, with um, Michael Reich from Berkeley and Bill Lester from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, we extended. And so what we did in um, our first paper published in 2010 was to look at all pairs of contiguous counties straddling, uh, straddling a state border. It looks something like this. So here I have shown you all the counties that are in the state that are straddling the state borders. In, marked in red are the county pairs which actually have a minimum wage difference over this period. The ones that are in blue do not. And the lighter shading is just uh, as a refinement, as, <laughs> as a side note, counties on the west of uh, west, western part of the United States tend to be very big geographically. So it's not exactly clear how local it is to compare you know, this sort of giant sprawling counties in the Sierras with this side of you know, Nevada. So that's why these are shaded out for sort of a refinement of the, of the strategy. But the basic purpose here is to show that there's a lot, there's a lot of places you can do this experiment with instead of just right here in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And you can actually do this uh, over an extended period of time. It's also the case that the same UI-based data that um, Cardin Kruger had to sit in an in a office uh, in, in DC to, to use in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, subsequently at the county level, you know, de by fairly detailed categories has been made public. So you can actually use county level data from 1990 to 2006. So better data, more variation over the 2000s allow us to do something that's much more general uh, than, than, than the original Cardin Kruger analysis and also allows us to assess what happens not just within a year of the increase in minimum wage because one could imagine that effects takes longer time uh, to look at over a much longer period and actually trace out the effect potentially up uh, you know, four or more years after the increase itself. And um, in a follow-up, uh, so in a follow-up work, uh, we it extended that analysis to look not just at restaurants and retail, which is what we had done in the original paper, but look at a high-impact group often studied in the minimum wage literature, teens. Not because we think teens are really important to study because whatever happens to teens is really important, but rather they're the, you know, they're the uh, canary in the coal mine because they're lo low wage workers. So if something is affecting labor demand for low wage or low skill workers, it's going to get picked up for teens first. Yeah. Um, so was the original hypothesis of the 94 study that um, increasing minimum wage would decline the job growth? That, that certainly had been the expectation of most of the profession. And I think prior to the Cardin Kruger study, virtu I think like the, the vast majority of economists would have thought you should see some, in fact, and if you aren't, you're probably 
doing something wrong. So um, there are lots of ways to motivate why we should look at places that are nearby. Uh, some, some of it is intuitive, but some you can actually just see if you just take, if you take two neighboring counties versus counties that are you know, farther away, neighboring counties are a lot more likely to track each other in both levels as well as changes in overall all right, labor market wide employment to population ratio, earnings, turnover rate, teen share, things that are, these are for the overall labor market and not for the low wage sector, so un, un, unaffected um, for most part by something like the minimum wage. So the bottom line is that neighboring places tend to, tend to be better controls on a variety of dimensions. Um, but I'll, I'll provide some other motivations for that down the road. So what do we find? So, the bo so here's what we find in, um, in our work looking at the restaurant sector. And just to put this in perspective, the restaurant sector employs something around 30% of the minimum wage workforce. Um, accommodation and food services together uh, hi hire some, close to half. Um, and adding restaurant and retail gets you to about two-thirds of the minimum wage workforce, meaning two-thirds of the minimum wage workforce is in restaurant and retail. Okay, so these are pretty important sectors on their own right to understand when we study the minimum wage. So here's what we find. V very clear increase in average earnings, so that's good because if your research design is picking up the effect of minimum wages, it should probably pick it up on wages, uh, and it does. So the average retail wage rises by about 2% from a 10% increase in the minimum wage. Prices tend to rise, uh, in, in, uh, and this is not from our work, but from uh, work by uh, Dan Aronson, uh, it's been subsequently, I think, confirmed by other, other work. Prices tend to rise something like by little less than a percent when there's an increase of 10% in the minimum wage. And that's an important margin of adjustment because, um, to put this in perspective, if the minimum wage rose from $7.25 to $9.50 an hour, it's so roughly a 30% increase. Prices in fast food would rise by about 2%. So that's two cents on the dollar. You know, not a huge increase, uh, pretty small increase for most part, uh, but it's, a, it's an important avenue for adjustment because that represents a pretty sizable portion of the cost increase faced by the employer. And again, Something people get confused about sometimes is say, well, if the minimum wage increases prices, doesn't that just wash out the effect of the policy and so nothing really changes? It's important to remember, this is increases in prices in the most minimum wage intensive sector. When you look at the overall prices, the effect is you know, minimal because most, minimum, most products and services are not produced using a lot of minimum wage workers. But price adjustment is an important one and it has consequence for who we actually think are bearing the incidence of the, of the policy. Yeah. I just have a clar clarifying question. So when you, what you're talking about here is specifically just fast food restaurants? This is for all, all restaurants, but if, yeah, this is for all restaurants except for the prices here, is, is for, for the fast food. But this is for all restaurants. This is from a hypothetical 10% increase in minimum wage. The results from our study suggest would have about a 2% increase in average earnings. You know, virtually no effect on employment, but in, if, if you look at the point estimate, it's, it would suggest about a 0.1% reduction in employment, pretty, pretty small. At the same time, a, a more sizable reduction in the turnover, a 2% reduction in turnover. And, and that's important because if we, for a couple of reasons, because that one is that it offers um, some insight into how the minimum wage may actually be absorbed in the labor market. One of the things that happens is if workers are, if they're good jobs and bad jobs from the worker's perspective, um, bad jobs are ones where workers tend to leave and as soon as they get a off, better offer. Well, the bad jobs become a little less bad, then they're more likely to stick around a little longer, right? and minimum wages tend to improve the quality of the worst jobs, that tends to reduce the number of workers moving from job to job. From the employer's perspective, that can 
reduce cost of uh, finding new workers, filling vacancies, and that potentially could offer an offset to some of the cost increase uh, from an increase in minimum wage. Yeah, question? So just, sorry, I'm No, no, really please don't apologize. The technicalities here. So when you're talking about an increase in the minimum wage, but you're talking about all restaurants, not just fast food, is, is this then including tip work? Like how is the breakout then for increases in general versus tip workers, which the rate is different, right? Okay. This is, <laughs> right. So that's, you're, you're bringing up a really interesting fact about the minimum wage and affecting restaurants. This is on average what's happening when the statutory minimum wage rises by, say, 10%. Um, in some states, there are what's called tip credits. So the minimum wage for tipped workers is lower. Sometimes it's pegged at some fraction of the minimum wage. Uh, sometimes it's just a flat dollar number, like in, in the federal case. Uh, but most states have it probably pegged to some proportion of the minimum wage. Let's say it's 50% or lower sometimes. So that's a, that's, that's a complication. It doesn't really affect things here, except to say that that's why the average earnings rise somewhat by 2%, it would be probably higher if the tip workers got a bigger raise. But looking at fast food workers specifically gives you know, very similar findings. That's why, it's, that's why I didn't put it up differently, except for that we, earnings tend to rise a little bit more. So um, we can also look to see what happens when you, in, you know, in this group, l younger workers, because teens are uh, low, generally low wage, low skill workers, and so have been heavily studied in, in the literature. Again, what we find is that um, using the same methodology for a 10% increase in minimum wage, teens also get something about a 2% average uh, increase in average earnings, uh, less than about a half a percent reduction in employment, not statistically significant, and it's the way to think about how large this is is compare it with the earnings. If basically earnings and employment change by similar magnitudes but in different signs, that means that a minimum wage increase does not change the wage bill of that group. In econo labor, you know, economics, we call it the labor demand elasticity is negative one. What that means in general is that you're pretty much not changing the size of the pie going to teens or to whoever group by increasing the minimum wage. So that'd be a pretty bad thing in, in that sense. When it's much smaller than that, that means that earnings are rising by a lot more than any change in employment. Same time, turnover falls also similar to when we looked at this low wage sector when compared to teens. So the takeaway here is that when we look pretty closely across these state boundaries, looking at places that tend to be more similar, following for a fairly extensive period of time after the, each minimum wage increase, we find pretty clear evidence that for highly impacted groups, we see sizable increases in earnings, reduction in turnover rate, but not much change when it comes to the stock of employment, certainly much smaller than the increase in, in the wages. So besides looking at employment, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a really good point. And, and this is actually one of the interesting things about the minimum wage. If you go back to 1938, it only applied to minimum manufacturing workers. Today, about 3% um, of minimum wage workers are in manufacturing. So 97% are not in manufacturing. Two thirds of them are in restaurants and retail. So it's very special. You're right. Like that has special characteristics. It's actually very representative of minimum wage workers today because they're largely in service sectors which are not easy, easily, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna drive 100 miles to get a burger. And, but that's actually sort of the characteristics of, of, the, of, the, of the workforce who's hiring them today. So besides looking at employment and, 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 uh, and I'm mindful of the time, uh, it, we can also look to see and looking at specific, instead of looking at specific groups, we can also ask what, what does this do to overall family income distribution, right? Uh, 
So for example, if we fundamentally care about what the minimum wage policy is doing to inequality, to poverty, we want to know what's, what it's doing to the overall distribution of family incomes. And so uh, in, in a recent paper, uh, I specifically looked to see what are the distributional effects of the policy. Um, and here, in this graph, what I'm showing you is, again, from a hypothetical 10% increase in minimum wage, what happens to family incomes across different parts of the distribution. So this is the 10th percentile, 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th. Useful gauge to keep in mind is that around, fifth, around 15th percentile is the poverty cutoff. This happens to be the case. And so these are people typically below the official poverty level. Um, and these are, you know, and then by the time you're at the 50th, that's the median family income, right? So clearly we don't expect much effect of the minimum wage on the median family income, but we might expect effects in the bottom. And what we find, what I find in this, in this paper is for about a 10% increase in minimum wage, at the 10th percentile, the family income rises by something around 3%. Okay? And it tapers off by the time you've gotten to uh, something like the 25th percentile of the family income distribution. What does that mean for poverty? Um, the poverty rate falls by about 2.4%, not percentage points, that would be huge, 2.4% uh, from a 10% increase in minimum wage. Now, in that paper, I also did a reanalysis, or actually just an analysis of, of the past 12 studies and try to get a sense of what, it, what does that say, so, sort of a meta-analysis. And what I found is that even though I argue that there's a lot of issues, methodological problems in these 12 studies, and that's why I wrote another paper, otherwise I would just summarize the existing ones. Even so, if you just took, if you looked at this range of estimates, and that's what I'm doing here, plotting a histogram of, or distribution of the estimates, you'll see that of these 54 estimates from the 12 studies that I pulled out, 47 of them were negative, so that certainly suggests that poverty rates tend to fall when the minimum wage rises, that while it may seem obvious to some of you, actually was not clear. And some economists have argued that there's no evidence that the minimum wage actually reduces poverty. And going into this literature myself, I, had, I was agnostic about it because I had taken that and I actually found that, in fact, if you, if you look at the existing evidence, it does point towards some reduction a little bit smaller than what I found, but not, not very different if you just average across these studies. Um, it's also the case, though, that uh, some recent work suggests uh, by my, my colleague, Michael Reich and Rachel West, that when the minimum wage rises, it tends to reduce food stamp use. So this is SNAP, food stamp use. Enrollment falls by about 2% from a 10% increase in minimum wage. Some people think that's a good thing because it means essentially you are getting paid from a job instead of collecting food stamps. But from a well, from, uh, economists might then also, or other people may worry that, gee, that means that you're basically not getting this thing called, you know, food stamps. So maybe, maybe you're just washing out certain other forms of income, like food stamps, by getting a higher wage. Now maybe there are sort of, you know, uh, psychological or sociological reasons why getting paid a certain way is important, but it certainly wouldn't change your economic well-being as most economists would count it. So for that reason, what I also did is to say, okay, well, we know this is falling, but what if we actually look at post-tax and transfer income? And what I found um, in this follow-up work is that poverty rate still falls uh, from a 10% increase in minimum wage, but it falls by 2% instead of, say, something like 2.5%. So there's some offset because of uh, reduction in, in taxes and uh, tax credits and transfers, but it certainly would not go anything close to uh, annulling the anti-poverty effect of the minimum wage. So where does this leave us? I've given you some stuff on employment and on some uh, stuff on poverty. You know, I certainly would not want to suggest that everything I have laid out here is uncontroversial. In fact, um, you know, I, I think the, while, and I'll argue, I think most of the evidence that, I, that we've marshaled 
towards this is increasingly seen as more credible than some of the older evidence from you know 10 years, 15 years, uh, let alone 20 years ago, uh, there are still controversies. And in particular, Newmark, David Newmark, um, same as the David Newmark from 1992, Salas and Washer uh, have written a couple of papers arguing that you know using these local controls, looking across state borders, throw away too much information. And they argue that, that I'm not sure what, uh, well, it's not exactly clear what that means. There could mean different things. Because you want to throw away bad information and look at good information. So uh, the question is, is it, are you throwing away good information? Are you throwing away bad information? So there are important ways to you know, assess, judge between the models. This is a general audience. I, I'm not going to go into some of the technical issues about you know, some of that. But I'm trying to give you some flavor of the kind of things that one can do to assess different arguments, right? different ways of looking at the data. Should you compare Massachusetts and Texas after you put in some general controls like the state's unemployment rate, which is essentially what the Newmark and Washer approach does? Or should you look much more granularly or find other ways of having more similar control groups, which we have advocated for. So one is just a statistical test, like are you better, are, are putting in these controls sort of statistically warranted in some sense? And that you could do, and you know, we've done that arguing that it does. But I think more interesting is to say, OK, to get a sense of is there a bias in certain approaches versus another approach is to consider some falsification tests. And I'm going to try to give you a flavor of this in the next couple of slides. One is to look at what's happening prior to the minimum wage increase using different research design. I think if you have a decent research design, you should generally tend to not find what we call pre-existing trends. Meaning, if you find that employment was unusually low or even falling prior to the increase in the minimum wage, and sometimes a year or two years prior to the minimum wage increase, you may worry that this is picking up things that are other contaminants, essentially. That there are other things going on in these places, and you're not sufficiently controlling for them. And one of the things we do, for example, looking at teens here, is we find that the, the method that you know, Newmark and uh, Washer have advocated often shows very sizable, sizably negative effects of the policy. You know, This is three years, two years, a year prior to the increase in the minimum wage. Versus in our methods, we see these numbers hovering close to zero, as they should, because it's really after here that we should expect to see some action, at least zero or later. Now, finding something in zero is not an evidence against it. But finding something in negative one, negative two, or negative three, one, two, or three years prior to the increase may. So that's one type of evidence, I think, that suggests that why. What's that? Zero is measuring implementation or announcements or legislation? Zero is implementation. So announcements usually would happen in, in this. Okay, so the minus one is Depends. Poss I mean, possibly. Possibly, yeah. potentially. But minus three, minus two, I think, I think that, that probably is. So a second type of m evidence one can marshal is to see what happens to groups other than who should be affected by the minimum wage? And here's one kind of an effect that is interesting. Here, going back to the family income. This is this familiar graph that I showed you, what's happening to the family income by different percentiles. Here, using model with local controls. Here's the, what I call the canonical model. And what you find here is that if you take this model seriously, it suggests that the median wage, the median, sorry, median family income is actually falling in response to the minimum wage. The, it just, no one would take that as a serious causal estimate. Instead, what that suggests is that for some other reason, the local economic conditions are such that the median wage, or median family income rather, is, act, is falling, even after controlling for the same set of things that, for example, you know, Newmark and Washer have controlled for. So overall, we, and I can, I can give you more, but overall, these kind of falsification tests to us suggest that the canonical model is doing a pretty bad job 
controlling for and accounting for these kind of differences across high and low minimum wage states uh, as compared to uh, a more granular form of, of controls. Um, and finally, there are other approaches that one can use. And you know, in, in the last few years, they're then using you know, geographic proximity. Uh, so in, in an additional paper, we have used a synthetic control method of constructing com comparison groups based on how well they match past patterns. Uh, similarly, um, uh, another paper by, by Toddy, that's another economist who've, uh, who's used a, essentially allowing for states to be fairly different in time varying patterns. And these additional work looking at teen employment tends to confirm a lot of what we've found. But essentially, uh, you know, I think it's useful to step back and kind of take a look at what's happened to the economics literature over time. And here I, I just you know, put up some surveys of economists on the question of, do minimum wage increase unemployment among low-skilled workers? So there's some surveys of American Economic Association members that were done in, there's, uh, th that I know of at 78, 92, and 2000. Um, back in 1978, 90% of economists agreed with this statement. In even 1992, about 72% agreed. And in 2000, it had fallen to 46%. So you know, this is sort of post Cardin Kruger. And, it, and while this is, not a, uh, uh, this is not a representative survey, this is a, this is a survey of sort of leading, 40 leading economists. That's a rotating uh, scheme. So the IGM panel at University of Chicago Business School uh, asked a lot of questions over time. So it's a good finger on the pulse of sort of the, sort of the leading edge of the economics profession. Um, and last, you know, I think in uh, two years ago or a year ago, they were asked, uh, 2013, yeah, so uh, they were asked the same question with respect to increasing the minimum wage to $9 an hour and indexing it as President Obama had pr proposed, and about 34% agreed. Again, that means the others were split between un un uncertain or there's not going to be an effect at all. The point is that you know, these are not, this is not an apples to apples comparison, but I think generally speaking, it's, I think a safe conclusion is that over time has more, and I would argue better evidence has been marshaled. I think the economics profession has become a lot more agnostic about exactly how large any negative job loss, any negative employment effect is likely to be from the kind of increases in the minimum wage we have seen in the US. And that's an important thing to remember because as in the next step that we go to, uh, there, those numbers actually are changing. And we may be in different places when it comes to the levels of minimum wages in the next 10 years than we've had in the US in the last 10 years. And of course, the effect of policy can easily change when we look at higher versus lower minimum wages. So what are, um, so what, 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 what does it make sense to do when it comes to setting the minimum wage? So I have, you know, I, based on my reading of the evidence and, uh, and comparative and you know comparative evidence um, I think for example setting the minimum wage close to something like half of the median wage for full-time workers is both reasonable in terms of past evidence of where we have been in this country as well as other developed countries for example in the UK uh, fairly explicitly targets something close to the 50 percent of the of the median uh, and it's actually not very controversial, including uh, the conservatives as well as the Labor Party. They, there may be differences of opinion, opinions, but it's not nearly as contentious of an issue politically as it is in the US, from what I can gather. So, uh, and, and I think the evidence there is, is certainly a safe reading, is that not a whole lot, you know, there, there, there's no certainly evidence of major job losses from, from the UK. Uh, policy uh, that that I can find. So where we are, so what 50% does in the United States, 50% of the median full-time wage, is it puts us somewhat above the last 20 years, but not incredibly so, right? So we, we have seen a lot of variation in the US between 40 and 50%. So I see something like if I'm increasing, proposing a federal minimum wage that would entail 
limited risk based on the body of evidence that we have, I would feel comfortable saying something like, you know, half of the median wage would be at a level like that. That doesn't mean that above that the world will end. I just can't speak with any degree of assurance that extrapolate this extrapolation would have any validity. So for that reason, I think 50% uh, of the median wage seems a reasonable strategy to me. Many states are starting to do this already, which is actually giving us additional evidence. Now, here is, uh, here is what I additionally have proposed. If you look at, if you go back to 1938 and you look at the, uh, look at the you know, uh, political debates around the time, the minimum wage uh, was set at a single number, but it came after a lot of debates about having regional differences in the minimum wage including just a sim single southern exception or southern difference, but also a just a more granular form of regional variation. And th those are rejected, um, and a single number was picked. And one of the reasons it was is precisely because uh, the m minimum wage is applying to manufacturing workers, and having different wage rates for when they're producing the same thing that can be traded, like cars, let's say, it puts different place places in disadvantage, potentially. Advantage or disadvantage, yeah. So with the, with the recent uh, post-recession, post-2008, most of the increase in the labor market has been from service jobs, from such accommodation and food services and real estate positions. But when you said that there's a minimal increase in employment, you, like, there's also the consideration that there's a lot of restaurants that are opening up that are seeking employment, but at the same time, there'll be restaurants that are having certain economic struggles, and there's a lot of fluctuations with that. But the main point here is that there's a lot of new business opening up that actually could offset that in unemployment decrease. How, how does your methodology adjust to that? I'm looking at county level restaurant employment that's net of any openings and closures. But you raised some really interesting uh, points about this new, new, op new openings, for example. So some recent work by Dan Aronson from, uh, from the Feder Federal Reserve um, actually finds that this lack of much change in restaurant employment is partly due to new openings, especially from larger, more productive chains in response to reductions in employment in some restaurants that keeps the average essentially unchanged. So this is very rec you know, recent work. So it may be the case that there's more interesting things going on. And that's certainly a sort of an ongoing research. But this is telling you that whatever interesting thing is going on, this is the net effect. So um, I, I think this makes it more, so going back here to, I think the fact that most of the min minimum wage workers are in service sector makes it more appealing to actually tie the federal minimum wage, I would argue, to a more local standard. So I can see, for example, um, increasing the minimum, uh, tying the minimum wage to either the median wage in a given state, let's say you peg it to 50% of the median wage in each state, or uh, adjust it using uh, regional pricing parity, which is cost of living. Turns out, if you do either of these two methods, the correlation coefficient between what the minimum wage would be in different states is about 0.7, pretty high. So because high wage and high cost of living states tend to not always, but often be the same ones. So to me, this suggests there are two types of indexation that should be done. One, I've told you that we went through 10-year spells, two 10-year spells without index, with changing the nominal federal minimum wage. That seems just unreasonable. Whatever level you think it should be, if you pick that level and index it, that seems to make economic sense. Uh, just, I think, common sense. Uh, but at the same time, given the vast differences across places in terms of local labor market conditions and cost of living, I think it also makes sense to tie it to, uh, to, you know, d uh, to local differences and have, it have, instead of having a single number for the federal minimum wage, have it vary potentially by each state. We're already almost doing that. 27 states have you know, and 30 of 32 had before. Maybe for very small states like Delaware or Rhode Island, you know, you can clump together into, into groups. But uh, generally speaking, I think having statewide variation would make sense. Here's, here, if you take, go to 2013, this 
provides you a sense of what the numbers would be and what they are. So in green are the state minimum wages at the, as they were in 2013. This, if we update it, it'll, these numbers would be a bit higher. The green, green bars would be higher. In purple is if what would happen if you set it at half the median wage. So first thing to note is that the half the median wage it would vary from something like eight dollars to something above thirteen, but that's DC. So really about twelve and a half if you look at states other than DC, between eight and twelve and a half. Versus at the federal level, it'd be nine seventy-five. So let me repeat that. If I set the minimum wage in the U.S at the me half the median wage, right? But did it in a flat manner across all places, it would be about 975 in today's dollars. Instead, if I made it so that it's half the median wage in whatever state, it would vary between $8 in Arkansas to $12 in Mass 12.50 in Massachusetts. Okay? So, what does that mean? I think it means a number of things. I think, in general, you will note that the, the states that tend to have higher median wages also are more likely to actually have state minimum wages, it's, although it's hardly a perfect correlation. But here's the really interesting thing. And this is the political economy of, of this. OK, so what is this graph showing you? It's the same graph, the, the, the half the median wage, but it's showing you Right? When you ranked by where each state would be by half its median wage, and then shaded by red or blue based on which way they voted in the last presidential election. Virtually all of the states that would see a bump up compared to that 975, right? So let's start with the 975 flat, right? 975 flat in US right here. Most of the states that would be actually higher than that are blue states. Most of the states that would be below that are red states. So imagine you're trying to negotiate a deal in Congress, and you want to get to half the median wage in two different ways. One, state by state, another federally. Starting with the federal 975 an hour, essentially, if you think Republicans prefer a smaller number, which they all pretty much do, and Democrats prefer a bigger number, which they tend to, you would basically make both parties better off, <laughs> right? So you can actually get to a higher number for Democrats in Democratic-leaning states and a lower number for, uh, for Republican states, and yet it having parity in an economically relevant sense, which is something like you know, half, the, half the median wage. You could do the same thing by cost of living, very similar analysis. So this is where the economics and the politics actually align to make sense to have differences, especially given that, as I said, 27 of these states already have state level policies that differ. So for that reason, I think it, uh, you know, when we, whenever it is the next time that the federal minimum wage is actually up for debate, for the first time around last year or two years ago, it was suggested, proposed as part of the Harkin-Miller legislation that the federal minimum wage be indexed to cost of living. That was the first time that was a, a serious proposal had been done. So that, I think that's a major improvement. I think, it, I think, I think I would also additionally advocate for uh, dispersing it across places that would align it more, I think, both economically as well as uh, it would allow for some political sense. At the same time, and I'm going to, since time is short, I'm going to, um, you know, I, 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 I will just leave you with the notion, or not leave you yet, but would leave this section with the notion that indexation based on median wage versus something like cost of living would produce something pretty similar for the unfortunate reason that the median wage actually in the US has not increased <laughs> very much. So if you, uh, however you index it with the median wage or the cost of living over you know, if, if, if the last 20 years is similar to the next 20 years, it'll probably be not very different in terms of the overall trajectory. Um, so at the same time, and I've already, yeah. So, so here, here's actually another interesting thing that I did mention about the political economy of indexation, is that Democrats don't like to do it. And the Democrats don't like to do it for this reason. The Democrats hope <laughs> that they think the minimum wage fight is actually really great for 
you know, getting people out to polls. It may be good for getting people out to vote. It, I'm not sure. I haven't seen compelling evidence either way. It certainly does not seem good <laughs> to get more people to vote Democratic. You know, people voted for, um, you know, uh, Governor Christie. People voted while supporting minimum wage in New Jersey. People voted, you know, every, every one of these states. You know, people are happy to vote Republican and increase in minimum wage. So I don't think that's potentially a very a successful strategy or good reason not to index the minimum wage, uh, purely as a, as a even as a political expediency. Um, and what's the cost of that is if you take a state like Massachusetts. A state like Massachusetts, here I'm plotting, just look at the red and the black line. The red is the national average of the minimum with, uh, with respect to the median wage. You know, back in 1980, Massachusetts and the US basically ranked similarly in terms of their minimum compared to the median wage. Today, you know, this is a pretty, pretty low number, I just, as, as I told you, it's 38% nationally. Massachusetts has the dubious distinction of being the, the third highest, lowest rather, uh, state um, with, in terms of its minimum wage, uh, barely above 30% of the median wage in Massachusetts, even though it's a, as blue a state as they come. Um, and that's partly because the min median wage has risen faster in Massachusetts, but it's also because without indexation, the minimum wage increases have been very sporadic. So that's a cost of, of not indexing, uh, and I think that goes against the notion that, uh, that you know, Democrats, I don't think Democrats are better at adjusting the minimum wage than an algorithm is. And so uh, I think Democratic vote or Democratic politicians are not better than, than an automatic algorithm. So, um, but that's the state. But uh, the final thing I want to leave you are the, with the cities. So as, you, as I alluded to before, there are over 15 cities now that have minimum wages. And some of these cities, like Sa Seattle and now San Francisco, have in place a plan to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. What does that mean? And you know, it seems like a very big number. It is a big number. Um, but it's important to remember to put some of that in perspective. So what I, um, as, a, as a way to think about you know, citywide minimum wage policies, it's important to remember that cities are, well, we're increasingly urban, but cities are also increasingly more unequal. So if you look at growth and inequality in the US, a lot of it has been between cities or within the biggest, highest wage cities. So you've seen this, if you look at small cities, right, there hasn't been as much increase in inequality within them compared to inequality in larger cities. And so larger cities are also higher wage cities and higher cost of living areas. So you've seen this increased polarization between professional and service workers, especially in the highest wage cities, that I think, uh, you know, I think that raised some more logic to having a citywide policy, especially given the largely service sector nature of the minimum wage workforce. At the same time, cities that are, especially in general, cities are more localized spaces. And so anytime you have a higher minimum wage in a particular city, that means surrounding areas are not bound by it. And that may create certain types of, types of issues. So those are some trade-offs that, that you may need to keep in mind. But it's useful to keep, just even consider the fact that cities are higher wage and higher cost of living areas. So a $15 number, for example, can mean very different things. So just as an example here, if you take the sort of the, I don't know, however 12 or whatever, however the biggest metro areas in the US and you look at what their median, half their median wage for full-time workers would be in 2013 dollars, I think. Um, in San Francisco, it would actually be $13.40. So San Francisco just passed a minimum wage going up to $15 by 2018. And this is San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward, by the way, averaged together. And this uh, is actually going to be fairly similar to, in today's dollar, what the minimum wage in San Francisco and Oakland together would actually constitute. 
So that's surprising because, in a way, it may seem surprising because $15 seems a much, much bigger number than anything we've talked about. But these are very high wage cities. And these are much higher wage areas than they used to be relatively to the, relative to the rest of the country 20, 30 years ago. So that's one point. And so these numbers uh, getting up to something like half the, half the median wage in these major metro areas uh, would, would actually be, look somewhat different. So we have already in place minimum wages in Washington, DC, San Francisco, Seattle, and San Diego in this list. Prob it, in being proposals are considered in Los Angeles and Chicago. Um, and in, in there are some talks about you know, New York uh, and, and Minneapolis. But, that's, but in majority of states, cities are preempted from increasing the minimum wage. So that's going to be probably a legal constraint like it is in New York. Um, question, why did you, well, why did they group together the cities of San Francisco and New York? Because there's such a big cost of living discrepancy. These are. York City and York. Yeah. Just using the, uh, the metro statistical area definition, they is a county-based concept. Okay. So you could go more granular, but this is these are picked because they're sort of connected labor markets. Yeah. And so this is a standard definition. Um, these are definitions that the Census, the Census Bureau, Bureau uses to define metro areas, but that's why it used. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, you, only would be it would be higher. And that's why I was kind of giving. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, they include the three largest cities within the. the okay. But just to follow up on that point, I mean, the politics of this, I mean, looking at Chicago, I mean, Indiana's whole approach to economic development is thank God you're not in Chicago or Illinois, right? So, I mean, if, if, it seems like when a, a city had heard of this, of these kind of broader statistical areas, poses something like this, all of the count collar counties immediately respond, yeah, go ahead, and, and, and you know, and you'll lose a lot of business to us. So, I mean, I, I understand like you've done some of this analysis between the states, but within states it happens a lot as well. So, so two things, absolutely right. First of all, though, we, um, one of the nice things about comparing counties next to each other is that it doesn't, you know, in a certain sense, it. That's telling you what happens when there are two counties next to each other with very different minimum wages. Could be city versus not city, or just other ways. But it does allow for the possibility of migration of businesses across places. Right? So I think in that sense, there's applicability, not just of state level analysis, because our analysis is not just state level. It's at the county level, at two adjacent counties that happen to have potentially minimum wages that vary by 20 30%. But what is also true is that you have to be careful in generalizing from the kind of minimum wages we've had in the US right, to going to something that's much higher. You know, um, so, for example, than, than, so that's, and so for example, if the Los Angeles minimum wage is set at $13 an hour, it would be something close to 60% of the, the median wage in the area, which is certainly outside of the range of variation that one can leverage because we just haven't had high, as high minimum wage. On the other hand, San Francisco's number, even though its top line number is $15 an hour, is actually still would be lower than half its median wage because it is such a high wage area as compared to LA, which is not. So there's a lot of variations. And another interesting variation is what the thing you raise, what happens in surrounding areas and surrounding counties. So coordination across cities within metro areas is, is potentially a really important thing. And here we see very different responses. So in San Francisco Bay Area, we've seen cities line up to pass minimum wages following San Francisco's lead. So you have now minimum wages in Richmond, Berkeley, Oakland, San Jose, right? All following suit from San Francisco having increased in minimum wage. In the Washington, D.C. area, you have a number of counties in Maryland um, that actually increase its minimum, their minimum wages in response to Washington, D.C. raising its minimum wage. So the politics of local coordination is interesting. On the other hand, the L.A. area, the LA, there's a lot of municipalities. And it's not clear how that's going to play out. So I think there are differences. And I think one of those 
th one of the things to keep in mind is kind of the municipal granularity <laughs> of a metro area, because a metro area is kind of a, the notion of this is a labor market, right? This is kind of a connected set of counties. But the actual jurisdictions may be quite different. And so that's one additional factor potentially to keep in mind. So I think that is a potential challenge. So another potential challenge is that there may be, for the similarly movement across city borders, I do think that looking at, looking at, at, the, at the county level, you know, we don't actually see much evidence of movement across the border. We've, uh, on the other hand, counties are less granular than a particular city, especially for certain cities. So there may be certainly some movement across city borders you know, for example, a retailer may choose to relocate and locate right outside of San Francisco, potentially. Now, from the perspective of the labor market, it's not entirely clear that's a big deal. As long as workers have the access to the job, whether it's on this side of the border or that side of the border, is probably not that important from the perspective of the labor market. It may be, however, important from the perspective of, you know, cities, economic development policy, et cetera. So those are some really interesting things to keep in mind. And we just don't know yet. Because we, we haven't seen raising the minimum wage between 50 and 60% of the median wage, which is where some of these city minimum wages are starting to place us. Not completely outlandish, as one might think from the $15 number, seems really large. But these are really high wage, high, typically higher cost of living areas. So at the same time, like Seattle, its minimum wage eventually will be at something like 58, 59% of its of median. So this does provide some opportunities. I think there's always threats like, will this lead to, for example, increased automation, you know, switching from high sk low skill to higher skill workers? All of these are possible. We, we don't know at you know the level, com you know, the, it, based on the body of evidence we can marshal. Necessarily, we can't speak with great confidence what would happen at 60, you know, percent, for example, of the of the median wage than at 40 or 45. But there's also possibilities. Oh, <laughs> that's my last punchline. There's, a, there's also more possibilities. I'll just put it out since more data. Uh, <laughs> that, um, you know, that there may be other types of positive impacts that, are, that, that also kick in when you have, when you're affecting, let's say, 30% or 35% of the, of the workforce instead of like 15%, including local demand effects that I think are very, not very large at all for the existing minimum wage increases. However, they could be for, for, for larger increases. We could potentially see, um, we have some initial evidence that even for the kind of minimum wage increases we've seen, we tend to have movement from low, so low productivity, smaller firms to higher productivity chains uh, in response to minimum wage increases. This is work, interesting work by Dan Aronson, again using this border methodology, uh, uh, following our method. Uh, and I think whether that leads to an environment where the low turnover leads to potentially greater incentive to invest in training, as firms might, because essentially workers stick around longer, you're more likely to invest in general training. That kind of effect could happen. We don't have very great evidence on those questions yet, but we have some I initial evidence, like we do see, for example, reduction in turnover. So there's some possible offsets. But the reality is we don't really know. But I am pretty sure we will, you know, in the in the coming years, given where the politics is headed. So I will end there. So I want to go back to your uh, discussion of the proposal for state level minimum wage, uh, you know, a national minimum wage that uh, reflects the meaning of my state, which I think is elegant. Um, it's politically viable um, because of the structure of uh, federalism in the United States and, uh, and for the other practical reasons that you suggested. And it would play a role in mitigating inequality within states. But on the other hand, it would leave um, in its constant place inequality across states. And you know, the, the patterns of the red states, you know, Arkansas, the southern states, some of the southwestern states having significantly lower incomes are obviously the result of a lot more than minimum wage policy, labor policy, right to work laws, um, uh, the nature of local labor markets, the mix of agriculture and, and uh, non-agriculture, et cetera. But um, I guess I just wanted you to reflect a little bit on um, the, the larger yeah. implications for thinking about how uh, uh, inequality is distributed geographically in the United States. 
I think that's a great question, and I, I think I can I, I definitely sympathize with the notion that there's something unsettling about leaving those inequalities in place. That was absolutely, I think, the motivation for, for having single minimum wage back in back in the 30s. However, I think the reality is that we're not going to really solve the median wage differentials across states using the minimum wage. It's just not going to happen. And if we're not, I wouldn't suggest doing that. But more importantly, it will not occur. And we haven't done that very much at all. So the gap between states are driven by other things that, frankly, need other tools to solve. The minimum wage has a role to play in reducing inequality. In the bottom half, especially the bottom third of the wage distribution, it is a way to pull the bottom up, and it can do that I think, pretty well. But it can't, in any, I don't know, very reasonable ways, affect something like the median wage, unless we're willing to entertain minimum wages even higher than what's currently being entertained. So in that world, I feel that it is better to peg the minimum wage to the lot of the median worker in each place. Now, the extent to which we can have other policies, be it workforce development or education or unionization, whatever else is moving the median wage and may equalize the minimum, it will automatically bring up the minimum in those states. So I think that's kind of a nice feature of it. Politically speaking, it puts the interest of you know the tenth percentile of the workforce and the median worker aligned, right? Well, one other thing, just as a uh, quick additional point, the differences between states might not be as great in some cases as the difference within states in terms of either median wage or cost of living. I mean, one thinks about states like Pennsylvania that have two big cities and then lots of small towns and rural areas in the middle, where the benefits of the minimum wage would be greater for those living in those low-wage parts of the state than yeah. the, the more expensive and more unequal uh, metros. Absolutely. And, you know, I think this is why, so two things. One, I think it's, one could go even more granular, but I think there's, you start getting to a place where, you know, the federal minimum wage, problem, there should probably not be no more than Hundred, <laughs> uh, probably, uh, probably, you know, less than fifty, actually. So I think what what you're saying though is an argument, as I see it, for potentially grouping together groups of states, especially smaller ones, instead of going more granular to become less so. Because California is a big state, Delaware not so much. Um, I think states and local jurisdictions will continue to have some variation, right? The question for me is, the federal minimum wage has a certain role to play, and I think that role is better served at making it more regional than it is currently. Does it have to be 50 states? No. It could be maybe 20 different things. It could even be less than that, I suppose, though I think it's makes more sense to have some more variation than having, say, just the four regions or the nine census divisions. Um, but you're right. There, this is, there's no, um, you know, there, you're going to have a trade-off as anytime you're setting a common area for any policy of you know, how similar places are across versus within. And states are different. California and Delaware are, are, are very, very different within each other. Inside and so I think one thing I would be curious about is <coughs> talk about this. I mean, let's say if the federal wage goes up to ten dollars, uh, ten cents or something like that, uh, what would happen to the workers who are say, slightly above, let's say between ten and fifteen dollars? I mean, what can be say in terms of the impact for them with the wages for them? Will also have to go up in order to attract them. Great question. So um, the best work on this is by by David Otter from from uh, MIT and, and, and Chris Smith and uh, Alan Manny. And uh, what they find is that roughly for the minimum wage increase in the last 25 years, uh, the, those spillover effects die out by something around 20th percentile of the wage distribution. So if you think like the binding minimum wage is somewhere between, right, like something like around the 10th percentile, it, there, between the 10th and the 20th is kind of a spillover, and then that is kind of where it dies out. So yes, minimum wage increases do lead to some spillovers, but they're not, they don't extend for you know, ad infinitum, um, but they're fairly more limited. 
that again could change if you're talking about much bigger increases in minimum wage than the scale of effect might be larger. But for the kind of increases about that we've seen in the US in the last 25 years, about 20th percentile or so, it's probably where it extends up to. Okay. Very quickly. In Yugoslavia, before it up, they had a policy of wage discussion. Everyone participated. Everyone talked over what work was worth. Two, gentrification, particularly in Philadelphia, is a very pernicious thing because the center part of the city is gentrified in very rapid rate, while the service industry population that lives around it is the poorest of the major cities in the United States. Uh, third thing, indexation would seem always to lead to uh, inflation and I'll say uh, invisible workers, both agricultural and domestic were not, I didn't see them anywhere in the statistic, and some of their working conditions are appalling. And I guess that's enough for right now. Oh, I guess finally, the United States and every place else in the world will fall apart unless the whole world's population begins to do something that people hate to do. Think. Thank you. Are you against thinking? <laughs> um, I think uh, I think a couple. Of, let me let me take a couple of those here first. Um, inflation and indexation. I think indexing the minimum wage has minimal effect on inflation because mostly because minimum wage workers are a very small fraction. Of I said indexation. I didn't say what minimum wages. I mean in general, there is a problem with indexation because it accelerates mathematically on the high end. I think, I think you know, our experiences with escalator clauses and union contracts in the 1970s, I think, seems to still haunt a lot of people, including the Federal Reserve. I think you're just not in that world. And so um, we have 15 states with indexation. I think the evidence from that is, is pretty, pretty solid. I don't see it creating the kind of spirals because it extends to a small number of people. But I, I, I respect the opinion that having mass massive in, you know, indexation across the board for all workers can be an inflation uh, thing. So just uh, um, on the point on invisible workers, but this is a really interesting talk, um, but I'm left with some concerns um, that we're overestimating the effects of minimum wage changes on some pools of workers, particularly if we're talking about the restaurant and hotel industries, which are pretty notorious for having extremely high levels of wage and hour violations vis-a-vis um, -vis other industries. And so I worry um, that, especially if we're talking about restaurant workers and not fast food workers, so kind of independently owned smaller places that a huge percentage of this workforce is off the books um, the last these industries rely heavily, in particular, on immigrant labor. Um, and that um, there's a disproportionate reliance also on undocumented workers. And so um, to what extent do we know that any changes, particularly at the federal level, are actually having an effect on these households? Um, because it doesn't necessarily seem like that a lot of existing um, labor regulation um, touches this uh, a huge percentage of this workforce, and in particular, immigrant workers. So if, do you have kind of more micro-level household data looking at kind of particularly vulnerable populations and seeing how these changes affect those groups or? Yep, so uh, good question. I think there's, I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of violation of wages and hours laws in, in the restaurant industry. The question is, does that mean that minimum wage is not binding? And I think that's not true. So the best way to get at this is if you go <coughs> and you do the same analysis using wage data from household surveys, what workers say they're making, and you go look at payroll surveys from firms that they're making, the effect of 10% increase on the restaurant, average restaurant wage using both methods is very similar. Not because there's no underreporting, but the idea is that even if there's, even if employers are, let's say paying you 25% less than they should pay you. Now the minimum wage rises it's, they're not going to completely ignore that. The same way that people drive faster than 65 miles an hour, but if you lower it to 55 miles an hour, their driving speed responds. So the same violations are proportionate to the law oftentimes. And so for that reason, you do see that whether you look at 
household survey based you know, wage information or earnings from payroll surveys, they respond to minimum wages in roughly similar ways. The levels are different, but the change is similar. Um, so I think that that's probably the most relevant. Um, we're actually out of time, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but uh, if anyone has informal questions, uh, you can certainly um, ask them now. But I want to thank Aaron for this really stimulating presentation.